or an Acts 20. We are so glad that you are not a fair weather worship crew. Doesn't matter, rain or shine, you're coming to worship Christ. He's worthy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage in Acts. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to, to learn it. Uh, Lord, I pray that as your word is brought forth, that your spirit is brought forth. Father, we ask that he is active within us. Lord, to stir up things in us. Lord, to change us. Lord, we come eager to know better how to serve you. Because as we'll read in this passage, Lord, our whole life should be directed to that ambition which is to simply hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, you done what I've called you to do. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this, I hope I'm going to too loud. I get, I get loud. I'm not used to being miked. I haven't been miked for preaching in um, a couple years. So, here we are. Acts 20, Matthew left off with this riot in Ephesus, which was staved. And we begin with the first verse here, seeing Paul's direction in Acts chapter 20. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and part departed for Macedonia. So just remember that there's an invisible map here. I'm going to draw it for you backwards on my side, but right ways on your side. So here's Asia. Here's the Aegean Sea. Asia's here. Ephesus is kind of in the middle, maybe actually it's kind of on the coastline there on the eastern side. And then he would have gone to Macedonia. He wants to go to Macedonia, which is kind of on the other side of the Aegean Sea, up and around, and then down this way. Okay, so he comes up, Macedonia is up here. He comes to the south. This is Ikea. This is where Greece is. Okay, where Athens is here. Corinth is over here. Got it all mapped out? Okay. So. He wants to do that. Why? Because it says in verse 21 of chapter 19, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia to go and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he desired to see Rome. He knows he wants to go back to Jerusalem to catch Passover. And so he's going to go through Macedonia first. Encourage the churches. We know from Romans chapter 15 that the reason he was coming through also was that he was raising support for the Jerusalem church who'd undergone some uh, famine. Also, they, you know, the Jerusalem church was always opening their home to pilgrims who came and heard of Christianity and, and they wanted to stay and learn more. So they would open up their homes. So no doubt they had a lot of financial need. And so Paul goes through encouraging them and, and collecting gifts from those churches on his way down. Luke doesn't mention that portion of why, only that he encouraged them. It says in verse 2, when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, he was, uh, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean son of uh, Pyrrhus, accompanied him and the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derb, and Timothy, and the, uh, and the Asians, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Okay? They went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Okay, a lot is said there. A month's worth of time goes by in about five verses. So, he, uh, he goes, he's down in, says Ikea, probably Corinth. And so he's in Corinth for three months. He decides he's going to catch a ship because he's already gone through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem, probably for Passover. Also on that ship would have been a lot of Jews also going to Jerusalem for Passover. What easier way to get rid of Paul than just plop, throw him in the water, right? That would have been an easy way to get rid of him. They could have just pulled to port. Paul, Paul, who's Paul? I don't know who Paul is. So he decides he's going to go back through Macedonia. And it's a good thing he does, because what he does is he, he brings with him some companions. It says in Psalm 126, verse 6, 
that though the worker goes out weeping with his bag of seed, sowing, he will doubtless come in rejoicing with his sheaves with him. In other words, the gospel had been sown with tears by Paul, and he is bringing back not only a blessing of financial help to Jerusalem, but he's bringing some representation from those different churches to Jerusalem to encourage the church with that as well. This was not a fruitless endeavor. Here's the fruit. Here's the leaders of these churches. So he has some companions. They go over to Troas. They cross back over. So Troas, right? So Ephesus is here. Troas is further north on the eastern side. I'm getting all confused. Okay, so. Wow. I did my bat, my mat backwards. So this is east, right? Okay. Here we go. Try again. So here's the Aegean Sea. Here's, here's Troas up here. Here's the Aegean Sea. Troas is here. Ephesus is here. So he went up through Macedonia and came back down. He was going to go straight down to Syria, across the Mediterranean. But he didn't. He was going to get some plots for assassination. So he goes back through. They, he sends the guys directly to, to Troas, back across the Aegean Sea, to the north of Ephesus. And then he, he goes and gets Luke. We know he goes and gets Luke because the last place Luke was left was, was in Philippi. And it says, we, right? So, Philip, as you can see now, we're back to the, the first-hand account of Luke. So, Luke has rejoined the team. After the Days of Unleavened Bread, they head over. They're in Troas for a week. So, in Troas, interestingly, we don't really have a mention of when that church was started, but there's certainly a church there. And it says here that they met, and we're going to get a, sort of a, a, an inside look at one of these meetings, that these early church meetings. It says here, on, in verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, okay, there you go, there's some tradition for you. This is why we meet on Sunday, because the resurrection of the Lord is on Sunday, first day of the week. This is the way we've always done it. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So this wasn't normal that they would go till midnight, probably. He's prolonging his speech. Paul is taking extra time to teach them the word. It's important to Paul that they know the word. It's important to the people in Troas that they know the word. And so they're eager to hear from the Apostle Paul. I mean, if we had an opportunity to spend a day and an evening with the Apostle Paul, could we get enough? I would hope not. It says that there were many lamps in verse 8 in the upper room where we were gathered, probably because there were people writing things down. They were taking notes. They were scribbling down. This is how many times you get the opportunity to hear from the Apostle Paul directly. But that's not really why he mentions the lamps. He mentions the lamps uh, because that made little Eutychus decide he was going to go sit by the window. I mean, you can imagine there's a lot of heat, a lot of fumes, uh, a lot of hot bodies in there, probably getting a little warm. So he... Eutychus goes over and stays cool next to the window there. And a young man named Eutychus, verse 9, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Oh, senseless tragedy. Right in the middle of this joyous occasion. Now, Eutychus was probably just how we know he's, I think, pious is the word. Hey, Brent, nice to see you. Pious is the word that, that is used to describe a, a young boy, probably 7 to 11. Okay, so he's probably Kirby or Killian or Jackson's age. So a little guy. This wasn't like a young man who was just slacking off. Somebody in some kind of teenage rebellion that was just kind of like, whatever, right? He, you know, he's just a little boy and it's late. It's past midnight. So he's tired. And it doesn't matter how deep it is. In fact, I remember being a kid, if, if a pastor was preaching and I didn't understand what he was really saying, made me kind of tired. Your mind gets overwhelmed and it, it adds to it. So Paul is just lulling on and poor little Eutychus falls out of the window. And he's taken up dead. Luke is a physician. If there were a mistake that they'd made, I don't think that would have been. The kid fell from th the third story, probably on hard pavement. But Paul went down, verse 10, and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, do not be alarmed. For his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them 
a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and they were not a little comforted. Wow. So the important thing about this event is that a senseless tragedy actually turned out to be for the glory of God, glorifying Christ through the apostle Paul. Paul was an apostle. It was important that an apostle could do the works of an apostle. And these patient believers, not only did they get to experience the word uh, of God being preached by Paul, but here they get to see Paul, the, the one who brings the message of life, actually uh, be utilized to bring to life a young man who, you know, for all intents and purposes, was lost. And so he restores the life of this boy. Paul's, again, once again, his apostleship is validated to that church, which is important that we validate Paul's apostleship. And they are not a little comforted. It says in verse 13, now this, you're just going to see how much of an animal Paul is here. But going ahead to the ship, we, okay, the party that was with Paul, we set sail uh, for Asus, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Asus, we took him on board and went to uh, Mytilene. And sailed from there. sailing from there, we came uh, uh, the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos. And then the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. So Troas is here. Troas is here. Sorry. Okay. We're back over on the east side. So Troas is here. Asus is just below it. It's also a port city. But there's this land that kind of comes out like this. Okay, it comes all the way in and all the way out. And so it was actually a much shorter distance, just a walk, than it was to take the ship. And I got to take the ship because they eventually got to go all the way to Jerusalem. But uh, they and Paul instead decides he's going to walk across. And it says that, that they went ahead meaning that they left Paul and the disciples that were with him, which means there were probably many people that just kept talking to Paul. And they have the opportunities walking. He's not going to be alone. He has this entourage of people probably asking him questions, uh, giving the opportunity to speak with him all the way down. And then finally, he gets to catch the ship. Mentions a couple of little islands that they go by. Chios, I think, is the birthplace of Homer. and. Uh, the other one, Samos, I th they think it said it was the birthplace of uh, the mathematician uh, Pythagoras. Pyth Pythagoras. Pyth Pythagoras. Wow, I'm so smart. Okay, so there you go. A little, a little extra education for you. That's extra. Um, so they continue on. He comes to Miletus and he, he sends to uh, the Ephesian elders. He doesn't want to go into Ephesus. Obviously. I mean, he just was in Troas and he couldn't hardly get rid of him. He had to get on a boat to get away. So when he comes to near Ephesus, he actually intentionally drives past the Ephesian port and comes down to Miletus so that he can call for the elders to come to him. He's going to have them come to him. It's not going to be a very long meeting. But what he instructs those Ephesian elders to do, how to lead, is going to be a little bit. We're going to take a little time to unpack that, because I think there's, there's uh, six principles of godly leadership that we can draw from what Paul says. It's something that you and I should expect from our leaders. It's something as elders that we have to pay careful attention to. And as, as believers, not only do we, we want our elders held to that example, but we want to be held to that example. Elders are leading you somewhere. They're not leading you so that you stay the same. We want people to grow mature. We're working ourselves out of the job here, right? So what does he say to these guys? Verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So there are six things I want to point out here. Now, this is all under the umbrella of serving the Lord, how Paul served the Lord, and how this was an example. Paul says um, in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So he uses himself as an example of serving the Lord. That's the umbrella, that this is all to do with serving the Lord. When, when we went to set this tent up, tent up, we had more than enough help. I was so blessed by that. That the men in our church were just like, oh yeah, what time? I'll be there. Let's do it, right? I mean, we're not a very easy church to come to. <laughs> Obviously, sometimes water's dripping on my head. Uh, we're not a very easy church to come to if you want to be served. Yet, so many Christians, that's how they look for a church. They want to look for a church that suits their needs. I have needs. I want to be served. And so if the things aren't appropriate for them, if, uh, if the music's not just right, if the preaching doesn't, mm, I just don't, uh, I don't know. It doesn't really appeal to me. Or if the children's ministry isn't just so, so that you don't have to teach their kids because they'll do it for you, then they won't go. We've, we've created a, a culture of um, consumerism in our churches. And that's wicked. And who's to blame? Leadership's to blame. Leadership. If there's godly leadership, there's an example for people to follow. And if there's no godly leadership, and leaders instead be like, oh, is that what you want? Okay, let's, let's you know, make the pastor's wife work overtime to do 500 different things so that every, all the needs can be met and then people will come because ultimately the goal is that people come. No, that's not our goal. We want a certain type of person in this church. We want the type of person that wants to know how to please Christ. I want to know. I love Jesus because he came and he paid the penalty for my sin. And I love that he showed me how to do that. I need a church that will show me how to serve Christ. Not people, not pastors, serve Christ. I want to know how to do that. And we want to be the church, and we want to have leadership that is able to pour into those people so that they can serve. That's the umbrella. Here's the six things. <laughs> First, Paul led, and a godly leader leads by, uh, his leadership is personal, say it that way. It's personal. It's real. He says, I know, you know, right here in the beginning, you yourselves know how I lived among you. You know how I lived among you. You witnessed my life. Now, there's a lot of churches that prefer a pastor on a pedestal, and the pastor prefers to be there. And it's very important that you don't actually know him. He's just the vicar. He comes and he gives you an oration from the word. You're stirred, and you don't really want to know anything about the rest of his life. You might be disappointed. But that's not how godly leadership works. You remember when the disciples came running after Jesus and they just kind of walk up to him awkwardly and, and he says, what do you seek? And their response was, where do you live? Isn't that something? Jesus led personally. He didn't have time out. I never understood the idea of a sabbatical. I'm going to be honest. I don't want to be too hard on guys who take sabbaticals. I just don't get it. I don't get it. What do you need a break from? Pretending? It doesn't make sense. Leadership is personal. It's personal. You should know your leaders. Now, some of you know me better than others. That's because you've known me longer. Or, you know, Jeff, he works with me every day. He probably knows more than he wants to know. But not only do you know them personally, but there's characteristics in their life which are consistent. And you can say, that cursed fat person's got flaws. You know what? I can see their heart is set on serving the Lord. If you have a leader that hides from people, you're not allowed to know him or her. They're not fit to be in leadership. You can't lead by example if nobody can see the example. You can't imitate something you can't see. It should be personal. The second characteristic of godly leadership 
is that it's humble. Moses was the most humble man who ever walked the earth. What came first to Moses was God's name. That was the most important thing to Moses. Next was God's people, and then Moses. When God wanted to wipe out the children of Israel for their rebellion, what did he say? Lord, don't do it. Why? Because your name will be blasphemed amongst all the other people that you took these people out here to die. What was he concerned with? He was concerned with God's glory. That's what he was concerned with. We see humility in action. We see Paul. How humble is he? You know, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking more of everybody else. Paul has time. He could have jumped on the ship and said, man, I got to get away from these people. Oh, I'm so tired. I've been up all night healing people. You know, I'm tired. I just get on the ship and sleep for a while. But he pushes his life to the max because he loves everybody else more than himself. He says in Romans 12, try to show, uh, outdo each other in showing honor toward one another. Can you imagine being in an assembly like that where everyone's just really concerned about everybody else's well-being more than their own? I tell you, if your marriage looked like that, you'd be tripping over each other, trying to do each other in love and honor. That wouldn't be so hard, would it? It'd be all right. That'd be okay. It takes humility. Peter beckoned for it. And most of all, we see the example in Christ, Philippians 2. I won't go into it too deep. Read it on your own. But hey, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. That took humility. There's a guy in town, we were going to check out his church building, maybe to you know get out of the rain and stuff. And we picked a tent instead. One of the reasons was, it's like, I say, what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Sam. And he says, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Father Tom, or whatever his name is. I said, well, okay. He's like, well, what do I call you? Can I call you a pastor? He's like, well, you can call me Father Tom. I gave him this look. I must have given him a look. He says, or you can just call me Tom. I said, all right, Tom. You're not my father. I don't even know who you are. It's this honor that we sort of do, and this happens in the South, too, by the way. People just introduce themselves. I'm Pastor Dave, right? You need to give me honor for who I am right now. That's not humility. You don't need to know anything about me. You need to know about Christ and what Christ has maybe done in me. Make him a big deal. What does it say? What does James say? He says that the poor should exalt in their, uh, should, should uh, boast in their exaltation, and the rich should exalt in their humiliation. If that doesn't make sense, how does somebody re rejoice in their humiliation? It doesn't make sense to Gentiles. But when you're spirit-filled, you're able to rejoice even in your humility. You say, oh man, this is the way I used to be. I used to think money was everything, status was everything, this was everything. Let me tell you, I glory, I boast in the fact that now I know I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's glorious. Humility is necessary. The third thing that's necessary is sincerity. Leaders ought to be sincere. He says that he... Serve the Lord with tears, with tears. He wrote to the Corinthians in tears. He had passion for what he believed. If, if the church was in sin, it brought him to tears. A, a world that was lost without Christ brought him to tears. He says in Romans 9 that, you know, is my earnest desire for them to be saved. I wish if it were possible that, that I would be cut off and accursed from Christ if it meant that they were included. Wow. That person's salvation means more to me than my salvation. How many of us can say that? But that's real. That's passion. That's sincerity. If you're not sincere about what you're teaching, then why are you teaching it? This is our life. This is our lifeblood right here. Ministering the word of God to the people around us. He says, and this is the fourth thing, not only is it sincere, but fourthly, that leaders are willing to suffer in order to continue to bring the word. He says, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. 
He just kept on going. Anybody who willingly avoids scripture because it's unpopular, you know, I think of one that, that it's always a big, big mockery, a big hearty har har. Whenever I tell guys in the, in the, whoever I'm talking to that I'm a, I'm a six day, I believe that God created the world in six days because that's what God's word says. Some people avoid that completely. They just avoid it. It's like, well, we know I have some theistic evolutionists in the crowd, or I don't want them to, I don't want to lose them. Sure. Look, we have God's word and we have man's word. I'll take God's word over man's word any day. In this church, we preach truth. It's not our truth. It's not your truth. It's God's truth according to the word of God. That's what we preach. And if anybody doesn't do that, they're not worthy to be a leader or a teacher or an elder in the church. When you're playing football, well, if you go in the direction of your end zone, you're going to get a lot of opposition. It'd be a lot easier to just turn around and go the other way. But the second you do that, you're no longer a football player. You're a cheerleader. We're not cheerleaders. We're believers. And leaders ought to be the first ones to continue on despite the struggle. Despite the hardship. Despite being told, no, you can't say that here. No, you can't speak that way. We're willing to suffer for the truth. And if we're not willing to suffer, how can we expect anybody else to? Fifthly, godly leaders are evangelistic. He says, that he testified, verse 21, both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's hard to tell people that they need to repent. They need to repent. They need to turn from their sinful life and they need to turn toward Christ, their only hope of life. But that's what's necessary. And if you're a leader in a church, godly leaders do that to the unbelievers in their life. We don't have, a, we don't have a, a system here where I'm too cowardly to talk to my neighbor, but maybe, maybe if I could just invite him to church, then the pastor will share the gospel with him. But if the pastor is just as will, unwilling to share the gospel with his neighbor, then why can we expect that he'll lead anybody to, to share the gospel or, or to have uncomfortable conversations with people? That's where that you know, compassion, that sincerity comes in. It, do I really believe this? If I really believe this, then my neighbor's going to hell. And if he's going to hell or she's going to hell, that affects me. That causes me to want to share the truth with her or him. And if you don't see that in your leadership, you're not going to see it in the people. You're unfit to be a leader if you're not willing to share the gospel with the lost people around you. We lead by example. Sixthly, I believe that godly leaders, they march to the beat of one drum. They're a one-trick pony, and i show you what I mean. They're a one-trick pony. Verse 22, And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The beat of a heart of a godly leader, with all those things encompassed, only and ever drives toward hearing well done from Jesus Christ, from a life that has a fulfilled ministry. There's a goal in mind. I want to make a major dent in this city for the kingdom. I really do. That's why I'm here. I didn't come here to start a cute little church, and then I can say I'm a pastor of a little church, and we have service. That's not what I'm trying to do. I want to see people saved in this city. I want to have such an effect that we start to experience the trials and suffering from plots of people that want to shut us down. Because I know God overcomes it. Jesus overcomes that, but beyond that, even if we die trying, we can hear well done from 
Jesus Christ, the one who's worthy of our life, the reason we do what we do. We don't forget that. A leader keeps that in mind. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind me, I press on toward the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our mindset. That is where we are going. That is the direction we go. We have no other other life ambition other than that. There's nothing on the side. A godly leader, a, a pastor, an elder in a church doesn't have a little side, a little something on the side. Well, I'm a pastor, but you know, just in case that doesn't work out, blah, 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 you know. I have other life joys. I've got other things I really like. And you notice that, you know? But if my whole life is you, because I'm serving Jesus Christ, that's not a what life that's, that's wasted at all. Or one trick pony. Finally, the application that he brings to these elders. In verse 25, and now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. He's vindicating himself here. There's going to be a lot of people he's going to mention later. They're going to come and try to badmouth Paul. But they know Paul. He's reminding them, you know me. Don't forget. I didn't hold anything back. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Remember that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you. Paul tirelessly cared for the church. And you've got to understand the weight that must be feeling. They could always depend on Paul to come and straighten out some problems, right? If there's a problem in Ephesus, Paul could always straighten it out. He'll come back through when Paul gets back, you know. Imagine your father, imagine being a young man and your father says, I'm going to war and I'm not coming back. So this is all yours now. You're going to have to look after the farm. You're going to have to look after your mom. You're going to have to look after your brothers and sisters. The weight of responsibility from that point would have been heavy. And they're feeling it. I'm sure they're feeling it. It's just you got to be watching out first for yourself. Watch yourselves and after the flock, which is so precious, that Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood. Watch out for them. And he gives this shepherd-style analogy. Fierce wolves will come, and they won't spare the flock. That's the thing about wolves. Those are nasty creatures. If they get a hold of sheep, they won't stop killing. They don't just kill enough sheep to eat. Wolves get this sort of like triggered natural desire to hunt and play. And all of a sudden, it just becomes a bloodbath. And they kill hundreds of sheep because they're defenseless. And so it is with false teachers. When they come in, it's not enough for them to just take a couple of people. They need major dissension in the church. They want to tear it apart. It's in their nature, like a wolf, to do that. So now is it important to lead the flock by example, to watch after yourself, to feed by bringing the whole counsel of God's word. But the third function of a shepherd is to defend. He defends the flock. There are some guys who are pastors today, and they can lead, and they can feed. But when it comes to defending the flock, some guys tearing their church apart, having separate Bible studies, contradicting everything that they're doing. They're like, oh, well, you know, I'm just glad they're (laughs) they're active. And all of a sudden, there's a giant rift in the church. Didn't see that coming. Well, you're not fit to be a pastor. We've had heretics in this church before. Some guy was sitting in the back. I knew him. I read his little book. We don't waste any time with people like that. Leadership in this church, if somebody comes and is new, 
We want to get to know them. Not because we want to beat them down. But if there are sheep that needs ministering, we want to minister. If they're a wolf, well, then we'll beat them down. No, we won't beat them down physically. We'll kick them out of here. We say bye-bye. That's what had to happen. I told one guy, look, if you continue to believe what you're believing and teach what you're teaching, if you're not willing to recant of those things, you can't, you can't be involved in this church. I said, I reject everything that you're saying about what you're doing. He's actually literally bringing in a Gnostic. This stuff always just kind of overturns. It's the same thing over and over again. But it was a Gnostic belief that he had the inside, between the lines meanings that God gave him, and that he could teach my people how to live a more sanctified life. I said, you're teaching my people nothing. He says, well, I can't recommend people to come to your church then. I was like, please don't. I don't need your recommendation. And not only do they come from without, but they come within. That's why he says, be, be on guard watching yourself. You know, we all have a little wolf in us. We do. If you don't think you do, change your mind on that. We all have the ability to take pride, walk in the flesh, and mess some people up. We do. We got a little wolf in us. I'm not saying you are a wolf, but we got a little something in there. If you start acting more like a wolf than a sheep, then you can expect to be confronted in our church. Hey, what do you do when you're gossiping about people? You're saying hurtful things. Well, oh, right? So you've got to be able to confront those things. How do you tell the difference between a wolf and a sheep? It's pretty easy. Sheep eat grass. Wolves eat sheep. You see a sheep eating sheep, any sheep, right? Got to be able to defend the flock. Paul goes on. Uh, in verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities, referring to his own hands, and to, the, and to those who are with me. And all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, a leader ought not have his whole life been in it to get money from people. There are people in seminary who literally are like, I'm not taking a church unless they offer me this amount of money. If your pastor lost his job as a pastor, what would he do? Right? What would he do? Does he able to minister with his own hands? Now, here's the thing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, that those who preach the gospel ought to make their living by the gospel. So there's nothing against paying a pastor to minister. In fact, what it does is it allows a man to be able to invest more time in the word, invest more time in his people. But you know what's interesting? Is that is something that the church decides to do, not him. If tomorrow this church said, Sam, we want you to be full time, I would say, okay, I'll pray about that. But we'll see. And if that were the case, and the Lord blessed it, I would say, okay, that'd be great. But I'd always be able to go back and work if I want to. Nobody could ever come and say, the only reason you started this church was to make money. Nope, my church asked me. And every time I've taken a, a ministry role, I've been asked. Every time. I haven't campaigned to be a pastor. Are you kidding me? That's the worst thing you could campaign to be. Please, big target, right in the back of my chest, please. Back of my chest? On my back. It's an honor and ambition. That's what Paul says. Anybody who seeks the, the, the position of elder or leader or presbyter, it's an honorable ambition. It's honorable like a fireman or a cop. You might get shot or burned. That's why it's honorable, okay? It's not honorable because people are going to look at you and respect you more. If anything, it's the opposite. But the reason people go into the ministry never, ever, ever should be because it's a good living. I've heard people say that before. I should be a pastor. Man, those guys, those guys make a lot of money. That's a good deal. No, that's evil. If you want to go into the ministry for the money, you're not qualified to be in the ministry. Period. 
when a church blesses their pastor and says, we want you to be more invested. You're a hard worker. We can see that. We want you to be more invested in what the church is doing. Then that church is going to be blessed for that. God will bless that. We shouldn't be in it for the money. That's for sure. Anybody is, they're not qualified. I mean, that's what, isn't that what Peter said? First Peter 5? Don't lead out of greed, right? Motivated by just greed for what people have. Man, it's just so easy for people to do that, though. They look a lot more polished than me, I guarantee it. They're good at playing the game. But it's always blessed to be, more blessed to give than to receive. That ought to be the nature of your pastor. Your pastors, your elders. They should be generous people. They should have that characteristic about their life. Now the whole, the full qualifications, okay, the minimum, bare minimum qualifications for being an elder are in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But Paul is giving instructions for being a great pastor here. Lastly, he says in verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. I've got a friend named David Grafe. Some of you know David. He was a pastor in Mongolia, I think for five years. Planted a church there in Rich Mountain, Mongolia. The weather's a lot like Wyoming. Not warm. And he, he invested in this church. He poured in this church. People were getting saved because he was sharing the gospel with them. And their church grew and was discipling each other. And he was able to disciple up the pastor, a local man, to pastor that church. And when they left, he said that they got in the van. And as they were leaving, <laughs> oh, stupid thing. Every time I get emotional, I say this, <clears throat> man up. When they get in the van to leave, all the people were running next to the van with their hand on the van. They just didn't want to see him go. If you're in the ministry because you don't think you're going to get your heart broken, that's just not the case. Because we love you guys. And we want, more importantly, because of our love for the Lord, we want to be bound together in unity. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one even as the Father and I are one. He prayed that. Those people love Paul. And you know what? Paul loved them. We're all going to be together one day. We're all going to get to rejoice around the throne of Jesus Christ. All those who have gone before, all those who are going to be saved, and we have the opportunity to enjoy glorifying the God, glorifying our God the way that he is now in the place that we're in. So let's remember these things. Let's worship the Lord now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the patience of these wonderful people sitting in the rain and listening to your word. It is sweet, and we are grateful. Father, I pray that everything that we have learned or studied out today, Lord, that we'd internalize it. Lord, your, your spirit would activity have activity in us to continue to change us. We want to serve you, Lord. We want to know how we can make you happy. So Lord, I pray that you would give that desire to everyone who's here so that we can continue to go out and we can be evangelistic, led by leaders that are spirit-filled men who are following after you. Lord, I love you. We love you. We pray that you're glorified by our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.